that heaven and earth will approve of our speaker this morning. He is the pastor of our community. He has really brought or allowed spirit to He has allowed spirit to be to use him to be his divine messenger. And so ladies and gentlemen, spiritual family, I invite you to put your hands together and raise a rounding um, applause for our beloved pastor, Reverend John Scott, we know as John the Beloved. Good morning, family. I've just been handed a note um, that says that the sale of ganja plants has been canceled. Uh, not because it's April Fool's Day, but because um, the Ministry of Hospitality has used the leaves to make tea for the after-service <laughs> refreshments. One sip, and you won't care whether it's April Fool's Day or Christmas Sunday. But since it is Easter Sunday, let me wish you, my beautiful Temple of Light family, a glorious, happy, ascended consciousness Easter. And we extend that greeting and that Easter joy to all the people who join us in consciousness on the World Wide Web. My friends, a six-year-old child given an Easter assignment by her teacher decided to write an essay and then to draw a picture of God to illustrate her essay. So she said to the teacher, I'm going to draw a picture of God. And the teacher lovingly said, darling, nobody knows what God looks like. And she said, they will after I'm finished. <laughs> they will when I'm finished. What an amazing consciousness our young people have. They have no doubt about their spiritual identity, about who they are and what they, their mission is on earth. They will when I am finished. And I was saying in the prayer room this morning, I wonder if Jesus thought about the impact of the work he did and the message he brought. And when he said, it is finished, did he know, as he must have, that what he taught would last for thousands of years and change the course of human history and human lives? Bill and Cher Houlton, a couple who uh, pastor at the Global Center for Spiritual Practices, in a blog titled, Easter from a Spiritual Perspective, The Resurrection Connection, write, and I quote, the world is filled with God expressing Godness as us. The world is filled with God expressing Godness as us. We are all expressions of the allness of God expressing its divine nature in the eachness of us. I love the term eachness of us. Unquote. So does God, what does God look like? Have I thought about that? So your first assignment is when you go home, look in the mirror. That's what God looks like. Because we are created in the image and likeness, not physically, but spiritually, of that presence and power that lifts us up to a greater realization of the glory and greatness of that which called all things into being and which sustains us in its own beauty and its own perfection at our levels of unfoldment. So does God look like us? The answer is yes and no. It depends, you see. It depends on how each of us expresses or represses our innate divinity. It depends on how Christ-like, Buddha-like, Allah-like, 
Krishna-like, great spirit-like, and I would also add Jah-like, we are, what, how we see ourselves. It depends on whether we realize that there is no anthropomorph anthropomorphic, which means human characteristics. There is no God with human characteristics sitting in the clouds in the sky who is to be feared and worshipped at the same time. It really all depends on our resurrection connection. And that is the title of my encouragement this morning, your resurrection connection. The gospel accounts of the first Easter, my friends, differ slightly from one to another. In the gospel according to Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 to 6, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had brought spices to anoint Jesus' body. Uh, every Easter, I have to say, you notice it's always the woman? You notice it's always the women who are left to do the work. It's the woman who nurture us from the womb to the tomb. It is the women who were at the foot of the cross, because all of the disciples had run away in fear. Brave men, bless their hearts. <laughs> but it's the woman. You know, my father was a wonderful husband and man. He had, went into, he, he had been into a hospital three times in his life. Once when my brother Dennis was born, again when I was born, and the next time was when he went in with a broken hip to spend his final days. He would drive my mother to the hospital and wait in the car for as many hours as it took, but him not going inside. And one time I think he tried and he fainted in outpatients. <laughs> we men, you know, we have this myth about us being strong, you know. Um, if you want to know strength, watch a woman in labor, watch a woman having a baby, and you'll know true strength and true power. It's awesome. One of the prisoners at the in the program that Reverend Mack and I ran, said that. He said, you know, he, his, his um, mother of his first child gave birth in their, in their little apartment because there was um, warfare outside in the streets and he couldn't leave. And so he delivered his own son. And he said, as I said, how you felt? And he said, how me feel? I know how God must feel when he made us. And then he said, you know, if every man in this country could watch his child being born, that would be the end of all abuse of women and children. Wow. When we lock him up, he needs to be up here talking to us. You know, so it's amazing the way our women step up and look up. And the Bible tells us, because in the market says, and looking up, you can imagine them coming with tear-stained faces to the, the, the grave, um, their, their faces half hidden by their veils, weeping, but they, they weep and they ball, but they still go and do the work, you know. God bless you, women. And they're wondering how we're going to manage this big stone. And the Bible says, and looking up, they saw that the stone was rolled away. Dear God. If we could only look up, friends, look up from the tomb of blame and shame and regret and self-disgust. If we could only look up to the spiritual magnificence that is ours by divine right of being, we would experience a resurrection so divine, so beautiful, so powerful, that it too would change the course of our own histories. And so this morning I come to say to you, the resurrection connection is a matter of looking up. Look up from the disappointment. Look up from the hurt. Look up from the fear. Look up from the doubts in yourself. I'm not good enough, I'm not rich enough, I'm not thin enough, I'm not fat enough. Look up for if only. Look up for my shoulda and I woulda. Look up from the blame that we attach to everybody but ourselves sometimes. It's always somebody else's fault. You notice it? Look up and you will find that the stone that has kept you entombed 
in error thinking. The stone that has kept you entombed, afraid to make another move, will have been rolled away. And in its place, the radiance of the risen Christ. And you know, you need to remember that that Christ was not Jesus' last name. I've never named Jesus Christ like I named John Scott. The Christ is your sonship and daughtership with that which created you out of itself. And we cannot keep that Christ buried in the tomb of our past mistakes. We cannot keep that Christ in the shadows of our shadow lives or you know, the parts of our personality that just don't work for us, the parts that perennially crop up, the jealousy, the anger, the fear, the disbelief, the anger, the judgment. Those are the shadow sides of ourself that just cannot keep the radiance of the Christ from shining. And when we shine that Christ's light on those parts of ourself that we no longer wish to experience and to demonstrate, they melt like the, the mist before the rising morning sun. So our resurrection connection is the recognition that when we look up to the truth of our divine being, we find something so beautiful, so awesome in its perfection and its wholeness and its joy that neither sickness nor past mistakes, not even death, can enthrall us. Wow. So when you get home today, look in the mirror and say, Happy Easter, God. Look deep into your own eyes and say, Thank you, God. I behold in myself the spiritual magnificence of the risen Christ. Can we say that together? I behold in myself the magnificence of the risen Christ. Can we say that? I behold in myself the magnificence of the risen Christ. You know, friends, there are various accounts, as I was saying, of the, of the resurrection story. And it doesn't matter. You know, Reverend Anne on Good Friday, last Good Friday, gave us the essence of the matter. The master said, love one another. There are many people, you know, still, and throughout the years, because of the differences in the Gospels, there are some people who, who believe that the Gospels are, you know, they believe in the er inerrant um, accuracy of every single word of the Bible, notwithstanding that there are many contradictory uh, passages. Beginning in Genesis, there are two accounts of the creation, of, of the creation story. But they believe that Every word is true, and that's their right to believe what they believe, and it works for them. And there are others who think it's only a fairy story, it's a myth. But friends, the message is the same. Love one another. What's so hard about that to understand? It never said love one another if you live in the same neighborhood. It never said love one another if you tore your check for the same thing. It didn't say love one another if two of you have the same bank or, you know, amount of money or drive the equally expensive cars. It didn't say love one another if you're the same color, the same gender, the same sexual preference. It just said love one another. You know, that is the resurrection connection. Can we look at all people and all things with the love of the Christ that said, I love you and I'll never leave you? So, you know, there's this business about the Bible being absolutely accurate and true, you know. Um, there's an a, 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 a author called Kenneth C. Davis, and he has a very witty book named Don't Know Much About the Bible. And he notes that this believing every word of the Bible to be absolutely true, can get us in trouble. And he tells a joke <laughs> about an old-time fundamentalist who liked to open the Bible at random and do exactly what he read. So one day he flipped around in the gospel, in the good book, and found, and Judas hung himself. <laughs> so hurriedly turning to another page, he read, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> Bishop Shelby Spong, 
in his book, Rescuing the Bible from Fundamentalism, notes that there are many inconsistencies in the gospel narratives, as we have said, about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And he says, too often we bicker about the details and miss that message of love one another. So my friends, the story of the power of Easter is for me both real and eternal. It is the story of my resurrection connection, my relationship to that Christ presence, my sonship with the living spirit almighty. And I know as I stand before you that that connection can never be broken. What an awesome reassurance that no matter what, you are connected to that which created you out of itself. That is, by the way, the, the, the essence of the story of the prodigal son, you know. Because we wander off into far countries and we, we squander our lives in all kinds of things. And while we are away having a good time and done in the money, the father is where? At home, <coughs> waiting. And you know the Bible says when he come to him senses, how many of us need to come to our senses and to recognize that the Father within is going nowhere? The Father within, call it what you like, worship it how you like, acknowledge it how you like, or don't acknowledge it at all. It dead eh? <laughs> it dead eh? and you cannot escape it. There's a sign in the Tower Street Correctional Center that says, none shall escape. <laughs> That is the title of the book that I'm writing about that prison experience. Because they don't know how true that is. None shall escape. You cannot get away. And you see, when the prodigal turned back to the father's house, the father never said, you brought you, you spent half the money, so you come back. <laughs> Remember the story? He said, I'm not even worthy to be called his son again. Just make me one of your servants. And what was the father? He said, you know, father... Forgive me. The father never said the words, I forgive you, because the father hadn't condemned him. The father had given him choice. As my friends, the father gives us choice. Wow, you know, you chose to be here this morning. That's an awesome choice. If you had missed me, you'd have missed a lot. <laughs> Including the ganja sale. But that choice is what puts our feet back on the perfect path. That choice is the great decision that Jesus the way Shoah made. He chose that route that he took. That was no hurry, come up and no buck up. He carefully chose his path. He knew what his destiny was and what his path would be and what his assignment was. And I want you to know that the, the big frog, I'm going to give it to you this morning because I just, spirit just said tell them. And, and mentioned it on Good Friday, but I want to give it to you again today. <coughs> Jesus made seven statements from the cross. You know what the first statement was? Anybody know? <laughs> Father, forgive them. For them not know what they're do. They know not what they are doing. And I just want to, to take a minute to share this business about forgiveness with you because it's a big frog for many of us to swallow. So many people say, me can forgive, but me can't forget. All right, Reverend, are you sure you don't know what him do me here? It's the hardest thing to let go of the, the hurt, eh? And the pain. And then, as I was writing this encouragement earlier in the week, it came to me. You know, when you have an aha, you've been hearing something and reading something and hearing it from your eye was at your knee. And suddenly, the truth of forgiveness came to me. Jesus never said, I forgive them. He said, Father, forgive them. He called upon the higher power within him to do what perhaps his human self could not do. Forgive. Wow. So the 
The lesson for me is when you can't find it in yourself because you are so hurt and so devastated by life circumstances, give it to the higher power within you and say, Father, make your manage this. Year. This are your own. Do this for me. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive me. Father, forgive every mistake. And that higher power within you can resolve every past hurt, every past mistake that we have made. So that forgiveness is the key to the resurrection connection. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. The science of mind teaching, you know, views Jesus as one who exemplified the principle of life in action. And so when you, you read the Bible, if you read the Bible, read it in the knowledge that it's really your story. It's about you. If you have one of those red letter Bibles that, you know, it has everything Jesus said in red, personalize it. Next time you read it, say I instead of Jesus. And you'll be amazed because it's your story. It's your journey. And it's your choice, your great decision about the path that you will take. So when that sun rose on the morning of Jesus' resurrection, the tomb was empty. Much emphasis has been placed upon the agony of his passion. But for me, that was just a means to an end. What the story is meant to show is that we too can rise up when, like the woman, we look up in consciousness and see the truth of our spiritual identity. Perfect God, perfect man or woman, perfect expression. And so, my friends, I have an assignment for you, should you decide to undertake it. Your mission this week is to look for those shadow parts of yourself, those parts of your personality that no longer work for you, the judgment, the anger, the sometimes the suspicion. You know how many girlfriends I have who search their husband or their boyfriend phone every night? And they look, look and find what they're looking for. Look for those parts of you that no longer work for you and shine the light of the Christ upon them. And when you, I'll tell you how to do it to you, because know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily easy. We are, we are creatures of habit, and if we've been doing some things, we've been doing it for a long time. I can't tell you how many times I catch myself almost about to engage in a conversation that is gossip about somebody else that isn't even there. Reverend, you, you didn't know so-and-so. So you know, it's very easy to get sucked into it. No, tell me, no what? No, when you find that happening, look out for it this week. And when you find it happening, shine the light of the Christ upon it. And say, like the woman in the story that Sandra read to you from the Santa magazine, no, I choose love instead. No, mine is the resurrection connection. And I rise up above this part of me that no longer works and choose love instead. So can we say together, I rise up and choose love instead. Together, I rise up and choose love instead. Say it in a half voice. I rise up and choose love instead. Say it in a whisper. I rise up and choose love instead. And now say it in your heart, my family. And turn to your neighbor and say, rise up, choose love instead. Happy Easter. Rise up, choose love instead. Rise up, choose love instead. Happy Easter. Rise up, So friends, you make the resurrection connection when you become willing to forgive and open yourself up to new life. 
and it calls for the surrender of yourself to the spirit of life within that is higher and mightier than outer circumstances, including illness and even death. So that for the remainder of this Easter holiday, I just want you to let that, that idea of the resurrection connection take root in your consciousness and lift you up so that you, you, you feel that sense of oneness with the divine. In the Science of Mind textbook, just to close, Religious science founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, page 369, writes this of the triumphant risen Christ. I quote, the Christ knows that his individuality is indestructible, that he is an eternal being living forever in the bosom of the Father. The Christ triumphs over death and the grave, breaking through the tomb of human limitation into the dawn of eternal expansion. The Christ rises from the ashes of human hopes, pointing the way to a greater realization of life. The Christ is always triumphant, is ever a victor, is never defeated, and needs no champion. The Christ places his hand in the outstretched hand of the universe and walks afraid through life. This is my Easter prayer for you, my spiritual family, and for all mankind. I see us all resurrected to a greater awareness of our own sacredness, to our spiritual connection with God and our unlimited potential as luminous, radiant, and love-filled spiritual beings. May the Christ in you, your eternal connection to God, make this Easter a personal resurrection for you and yours. Namaste. Yes.